My name is Ann Noble. I am an actor, playwright, director, arts educator, jail chaplain. I'm with Antias Theatre Company, and I'm the author of the zip code play Blue Like You, which takes place in the women's jail in Linwood, California. That's in Los Angeles. Please come to um, Antias to listen to it. And also, please listen to this interview if you want to know more. Fell in love with theater. Um, I, I don't remember not being in love with it. So I kind of, I guess I came out of the womb this way. Um, I've always done performing as a little kid I did. Um, of course it helped, both my parents were involved in theater. So um, back in the day, quite a long time ago, um, my dad was a physicist at Berkeley getting his doctorate and my mom was an undergrad at Mills College, so up in the Bay Area. And um, they, he, my dad's also a musician, and they started a theater company out there together. Uh, it was called the Woodminster Amphitheater, or I guess they didn't start it, but they joined it, and they did summer musicals. So as my sister and my brothers were born, and then we moved eventually to the East Coast, but I, we just were always talking about theater. We had musicians, dancers, um, and I'm the only one who, after that, my parents left theater and went to do other things. Um, but I'm the one, only one who's really stayed in it and done it professionally. Um, my older brother has produced a lot. He he acted and sang, but he also um, produced produced um, Jekyll and Hyde and Thoroughly Modern Millie and um, you know some of those uh, big ones. He um, so we've always been involved in theater and um, I just always fell in love with it. I fell in love with it. I always wrote, I always performed, I always directed because I really, as my mother would say, I really liked telling other people what to do when I was younger. Um, but I've just always done it. I can't remember not. And I remember, um, or, you know, I always did the plays in high school and all of that. And I remember being shocked that a lot of my friends who did plays in high school weren't going to do it in college or weren't going to do it professionally. I was confused. I was like, well, why not? You're so good. They're like, well, I want to do something else. And I was like, what is else is there? I just didn't really think about it. So um, I've always done it my whole life. And um, in particular, theater, um, that was always my first love, the live audience. And um, I also just love um, how things get transformed in the theater. You know, um, in a film, you see what you see. And not that there isn't gorgeous creative work in cinema. Of course there is. But I love that in the theater, you can turn a chair into a throne just by the way you respond to it. By the human body responding to that chair transforms it into something. And there's no other medium that does that for me. So there's something quite magical about us. My writing... I always crafted little stories when I was a kid. So um, when my friends would play, we would make up very elaborate stories. And um, I would always, I always thought that meant I wanted to be an actor. I thought that that meant that, oh, I'm gonna, yeah, I wanna be an actor because I wanna be a performer. Um, but then what happened was um, I just wrote stories. I wrote short stories and, always and and i had a few teachers who were just incredible i was so blessed to have such a really unbelievable education just so many resources in the arts and um so when i wanted to pursue something i was able to it was just pretty miraculous i think back now um but those teachers encouraged me they're like your writing's really good i, was, I didn't think anything of it. i was like oh it's just they're just little stories they're like no it's really good so i always had that encouragement and then it wasn't until really college. I went to Northwestern and um, when I was a sophomore, they brought back the playwriting program. It had been absent from the college for the theater program for a long time. And they brought it back and right in the middle of registration. So you know how the sophomores always get the worst choice of classes. Um, they opened up the class right as the sophomores were registering. So I got in the class and that I would say changed my life. That class, I just... I got it. I was, oh, playwriting. That's it. That's what I want to do. Um, I love short stories. I still do write poems and short essays and things like that. But 
playwriting just I something happened I just got it and that was it and then that was it I was off and running and I just have never stopped since then that's just been and yes uh you use the word obsession that is correct it is an obsession I I can't imagine not doing it that really I would that would be odd <laughs> my process it um it always varies a little bit with each play with each piece um I have always believed that every written piece exists perfectly and my job is to clear away the mess. So very much the Michelangelo, the sculptures inside the block of stone and we have to chip away and it will reveal itself. So I've always had a very healthy, what I consider to be healthy relationship with my work. It's not my job to force it or to make it into something I want it to be or to, um, I also, it's not there to, um, it's not there to solve some problem. Writing um, a piece is there to illuminate something, to shine a light on something that maybe hasn't been seen before or the way I'm seeing the world. So I very much, um, I very much have that sort of way of being relationship. So um, for me, it always sort of starts with a little idea, a little flash of something. Um, I'll be at the theater doing something else and someone will say something and I'll be like, I wonder what would happen if that was a mom talking to a daughter or I wonder what would happen if that was, um, if people were hiding in this place, I wonder what would happen. So it's very much that kind of um, thing. So or I'll hear a name that's very interesting and I'll just kind of play with it. And then usually what happens is I play with the idea in my head. I toss it around for quite some time. It can be a long time. Um, and when I say long time, it can be years. Um, there's plays that I've been working on for 10, 15 years. Um, they just are rattling around or rattling around. And then, and then usually what'll happen is I'll start writing. I'll just start writing and it will just, come out, I'll start having the characters talk to each other. And then there usually comes a point where I put it to bed. I'll write a lot and then I'll just not know what to do and I'll just leave it. And then something will happen. Sometimes it's a year later, a few months later, sometimes it's many years later, something will happen. I'll get the spark and then I'll go back into it. And then it usually becomes a very fast, several, like a couple of weeks that it gets finished. That's usually my process. A little bit different every time, but that's usually my process. And then in terms of producing it, that has always been a bit different. I've produced my own work. Um, back in 1995 um, in Chicago, I started a theater company to produce my first play. And that was with my family, with my theater family. Um, and we, I wrote this play over the course of about a year and we decided let's do it let's produce it ourselves and that gave birth to my theater company called shawnakee theater company um, in chicago which then has become since then the irish theater company of chicago and it's still running like it's still there and, and some of the people the founding members are still there and that's pretty incredible and so um yeah so a lot of my plays were produced at my own theater company and then once that happened and people started to get to know my name. Other theater companies in Chicago produced my work. Uh, Victory Gardens um, was one. Um, uh, the Next Theater, I don't know if they're still around anymore, up in Evanston. And then um, when I moved out to Los Angeles, um, kind of the same process happened. I worked with The Road Theater, um, with Interact, um, and now with Antius. And um, I've just been really blessed to have a lot of wonderful artists in Los Angeles that support my work. Um, Echo Theater Company, Courage Theater Company, Moving Arts Theater Company. Um, gosh, I know there's more out there and I'm gonna forget them, but there's more out there. Um, but yeah, so uh, I'm really blessed at this point in my career that if I ask people to read a play of mine, they do. Um, and so I, um, yeah, that's kind of the process. It just, and it really depends. Each piece is a little bit different, but um, but that's kind of the way it works. The theater experience is a unique form because um, it happens right now. It's right here, right now. You know, when we're watching a movie, the movie's done. It's we're watching a painting.
it's over it's done now our, we're experiencing it now but we're not with another human being i mean we may experience it with you know our loved one on the couch and watch a movie um but the thea- theatrical experience is happening right now right in front of you there's nothing like it all other art forms are done and it's like going to a live orchestra it's happening right now we like recordings we like to have it all recorded and we're listening to it in the past theater is happening now right in front of us and it also requires us to focus you can't like check your whatsapp and your facebook and your text message while it's happening um when you go to the theater i mean people do we know this but when you go to the theater you are doing practicing sustained listening Where else do you do that in this world today? Nowhere else. The zip code plays, even though they are pre-recorded, that is a pre-recorded experience. It's uninterrupted. It's 25 minutes of listening. I encourage everyone to practice sustained listening. It's very hard to do in our world, but the theatrical experience, you're not doing anything else while you're doing that. You're doing one thing. You're listening to a story. So for years, I was over at the Road Theater um, in North Hollywood in that Lancashire space, and Antius was next door. So I knew I knew a lot of fellow artists. There was a lot of, um, you know, as theater artists in Los Angeles, we all kind of work at all the theaters. There's this wonderful network of people, and, you know, we, we do know each other. It's, it's strange because a lot of people come to Los Angeles, they think there's no theater here. There's a gorgeous theater community. Um, it's just different because we're so spread out, but we all sort of work with each other, and little groups pop up and um, I got asked a couple of NTS members had come to see some stuff over at the road because it was next door and then I got invited to participate in a reading and then eventually asked to audition for a show oh gosh a long time ago called the malcontent which I was then cast in and then I was asked to become a company member um, right after that um, but I think for me why I want it, first of all, I'm classically trained. So I got classically trained at Northwestern. I love Shakespeare, Chekhov, Shaw, Pinter, you know, Stoppard, um, Carol Churchill, Lorraine Hansberry, um, Alice Childress. Like these just, I, I love rich text. I'm just, I love words. I always have. And um, I grew up actually, um, this will add up. Um, I'm legally blind, actually. I grew up not being able to see at all. And so from a very young age, they didn't realize it until I was in second grade when I finally got glasses and, oh, that's what's on the blackboard. Um, so my eyes are terrible. So I can be corrected to almost 2020, but not really with, you know, contact lenses and stuff, but I can't see. And so my early childhood, because they didn't know that, everything is auditory for me. So everything is about what I hear and the rhythm of speech and how people talk. And so to have a classical theater company in in LA that was doing like marrying the classics with what we see today. And so I'd always wanted to work there. The reputation was so high. I just, I loved, I would go to their readings, I'd see them and they were just such really beautiful actors and they honored the text, but they were also so themselves and I just, I was so flattered when I got asked to do a reading and then got asked to audition for a play. I worked so hard on that audition. I was like, I want to do this. And it's just become this place I call home, you know? And um, I, I'm so proud of the work we've done. I'm proud of what we're doing right now. Um, you know, it's this, this last few years have been so hard. You know, I think in addition to COVID, a lot of groups and organizations are really taking a hard look at themselves and um who they want to be in the world and we've been doing that and i'm i'm really proud of what we've done and what we're trying to do and um there is no point in doing a classic if it can't be told today and if the people who are listening can't hear it and that to me is so important and so for Antius, I think it's this beautiful 
we're always in this tension of how do we honor the classic but do it today and we fight about it you know we go we're like how are we gonna do this and so i um i love being a part of that tension i love being a part of people that care so deeply um and i also you know antius was founded by actors who were working in film and television and while that can be so rewarding and exciting found some of it wanting and wanted to go back to their theatrical roots to stay trained up and that to me is absolutely where i fit uh it that's my philosophy that's my belief system and so um and i also just i don't tend to do anything halfway so anytime i'm a member of something group or whatever i just kind of go in so after I was asked to be a company member, then I started helping out backstage. I um, then eventually was asked to be the company manager, which I did for two and a half years or almost two and a half years was company manager. I've done casting there. I run the arts education program. So um, I've hosted a lot of readings. I I kind of immersed myself in the company um, and uh, and never looked back, just never looked back. So I was there at the very beginning, actually, um, when um, Ed Napier, this wonderful writer, a good friend of Rob Nagel's and John Sloan's and Emily Chase and I, I believe that's kind of the founding group, uh, this playwright said, hey, you guys, come on, let's, you guys have these great actors, why don't you do new plays too? And there was a bit of, well, that's not what we do. And he's like, yeah, but how do you know there's not a new classic out there? Good point. And um, so we formed it. I was in on that original, those original meetings. And we didn't want to do Mondays because everyone has classes and does stuff on Mondays. So we're like, let's just gather in the library Tuesday nights. Let's just start reading new plays. Let's just bring in some playwright friends we have. And so I was there from the very beginning. Um, as I hadn't written at that point, I hadn't written in a very long time. I hadn't really written anything new. I was mostly being an actor. Um, and I was working at NTS's um, company manager. So um I was really, um, I was writing new media, but I wasn't really writing plays. And so I thought, oh, this will be a great way to kind of get back in and just kind of bring some old stuff in and see where I'm at. And um, it did the trick, man. It really kickstarted my career back up. And it was funny. I brought some old material that wasn't really finished that has now been finished, several plays. And then I also brought back some old stuff that I had finished and I looked back, I was like, wow, this is not really what it needs to be. This is a little not up to snuff, as they say. Um, And uh, so I was there from the very beginning. And initially we were just meeting on Tuesday nights very casually. Um, There were days it was five people. There were days it was 50 people crammed in that library. Um, oh God, I say that now with COVID and I think, oh, 50 people in a small space. It's not funny. Um, but yeah, we just kept meeting. We just kept meeting and meeting and meeting. And then it sort of became something more formal and we started doing more formal projects and we've built these relationships with these amazing writers. Um, writers have come and gone. Um, we have members we haven't seen in a while cause they're off doing their stuff. And then people come back, people bring in new friends. Um, the, the level of talent is just, you know, writers, we're an odd bunch because we don't tend to publicize ourselves as much. We don't tend to get out there. People see our work. They don't know who we are as much. Um, and I mean, if we're actors or we have actors in our family, that's different. But a lot of us kind of hide out. And so it offered this place where writers could really we could meet writers and just we could meet each other and share what's going on in the world, where we're having trouble, where things are going really well, on this whole world of new media that opened up. I mean, I I write for new media and I was writing, back in the day, a friend of mine said, we should write a web series. I was like, what's a web series? It's like a TV series, but it's on the web. What do you mean? You know, now it's new media, now it's a whole thing, you know, It, it just, so as the options for writers have expanded, and now with COVID, Zoom. I mean, I write for Zoom and I have playwright friends. We write for this medium. It's a whole different medium. Um, so it has become just this wonderful place where we can connect. Um, we always have these deadlines. So we always are producing something. My most recent play that I finished was because of a Playwrights Lab deadline. I signed up to write for a deadline. I signed up for a date and they were like, you need to have 20 pages. And I said, well, I'm gonna go grab something old. I was like, no, I should write something new. 
And I wrote 20 pages and then I finished that play in two weeks, which was crazy. Now it had been an idea that had been percolating for three years, but because of that deadline, I have a brand new play. And, and also I know it's a supportive environment where I can, you know, I can bring my stuff and know I'll be supported and cared for. And I, you know, the critique is always so smart and it's just so everybody's coming from different walks of life. So you just get these thoughts you'd never heard of before, but you also, we've become a family. So we also know how to parse out that information too. You know, someone will throw something at you and you're like, oh, that's an interesting idea. Oh, but you know, no, that's not for my play. Or someone will throw something out. You're like, no, that's, oh wait, that's, so it has this wonderful collaborative vibe. So um, I was in it in the very beginning and I just, again, have never looked back. I, I wouldn't want to ever step away from that group. It's been very influential and powerful for me as a writer. One of um, the perks, if you say, or the, the joy of the Playwrights Lab is the level of actors that are reading. Um, and I think because all of our actors that come to us on some level have some kind of classical training. Now, whether they went to formal school or whether they just love Shakespeare or they, or they love poetry or there is this honoring of the text. So whatever actors we get, they love words and speaking words. And they also just go for it. Like nobody comes to the lab and is, I love you, Brenda, you're amazing. No one's just reading. Even the playwrights, when they read other people's stuff, there's this um, energy and care and love and celebration of the written word. Or even if we have some writers that write in really high style, you know, the, you think of the visuals as they're, as they're writing and actors will play in this zoom box, you know, they'll play and they'll, they'll do stuff. So just the, the leap into the unknown that the actors that Ant that are associated with Antias, whether they are direct members or not, there is this, um, I guess there's this understanding that the bar is really high, so you better jump. And it's an exciting one, you know, it, it, it really, anytime I get asked to read in the lab, I do it up, like I prepare, I read the script, I, you know, I make some choices. I sometimes put on silly wigs or whatever. We we all really um, bring our best foot forward and just leap into it. Um, and I think it's, you know, a lot of it's the reputation of Antias that, you know, this 20 some odd years that we've been here and always done really exciting, good work. Um, I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, but I also, I think people, I guess just, I think people are hungry for new good work. And I think people are also hungry for work that is not just about what I call issue plays, like, or my friend calls them C plays. Like someone writes a play where someone's dying of cancer. It's like, oh, C, cancer's bad. Or C, our world's in turmoil. But I find that the playwrights in this lab in particular, and there are other labs too that do a great job, but I have found they're writing on a deeper level than that. It's not just, oh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. What does that really mean for a human being to be trapped and locked up? What does it mean to have these unbelievably difficult racial issues that we can't talk about? What does that really mean? Not that, oh, racism's bad, but wait, what does that really do to a human? to believe that certain people are less than or to not know that you think the way you think. So I, I find that the, the group we've brought together, we're really encouraging everybody to dive deeper. And I think that has come from this foundation in classical text and not in the snooty way of classical text, like, oh, we know Shakespeare. No, that there is something the writers who have gone before us are telling us and we need to listen. And classical text does not mean Shakespeare. It does mean James Baldwin. It does mean, you know, Janae Park. And I just, it, 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 we are opening up to who are the shoulders that we stand on? Who are those people, those writers, those artists? And I think because of that lineage in that way, that connection, I think it inspires writers to really bring deeper work, not just work of the day. And I think that um, I'm guessing that's why we get so many incredible actors because they want to be a part of that kind of work. They don't want to just do, 
surface level stuff. And so I think it's an attraction rather than a promotion. You know, we just get actors who, you know, really want to be a part of that. And I think too, even actors maybe that think, oh, I'm not as, I don't know the classics. I can't participate. I find when there's really deep, beautiful human work, it call it calls out the best in every actor as well. So maybe actors that are younger, they're like, oh, I don't really have training in the classics. They find all of a sudden, oh, wow, I know how to do this because it's asking of them something deeper. And I think that's really important. And maybe that's why I don't have all, I don't, I'm not showing it for sure, but that may be why. The story for Blue Like You uh, and Linwood came because um, I'm actually a jail chaplain. Um, so I have been visiting the LA County jails for gosh, going on five years now. I've been um, part of a group called Prism Restorative Justice, which was founded uh, by two Episcopalian monks. Um, their monastery is called the Community of Divine Love. And I got involved with them through a very long security story through All Saints Church, through theater, through Boston Court, this amazing story. Um, uh, but I've worked with um, incarcerated youth for a decade doing a theater program through NTS Theater Company. Um, and I started going into the jails as a chaplain, just sitting with people, doing church services, doing spiritual work, reading poetry, creative work. Um, and it's a call. Um, I feel at home in the jails, which uh, is, may sound crazy to some people, but it's where I find it's just my home. And um, so when I've never written anything about my experience in the jails, I've written poetry, but not anything that's really um, been in theatrical dramatic form. And um, when the zip code, zip code plays started, um, I, you know, the zip code plays actually started because of Ed Napier, that that writer I told you about that started the Playwrights Lab, he was the one that came up with the idea of it. And we did two versions of it back in person at Antias a while ago. And um, and I participated in both of those. Um, I wrote a play set in um, uh, in Burbank, and I can't remember where the other one was set, um, but I did Burbank Airport. Um, and so I knew what the zip code plays were about. And then when we decided to do radio plays for COVID, I thought, oh, this is brilliant. Um, and I didn't submit initially to write one. I was busy doing other things. And then when the second round came about, I pitched Linwood. I was like, nobody knows that this women's jail is right in the heart of Linwood and, you know, where the Rodney King riots were. And, and the women's jail was the first jail I went into. Um, and I had a profound experience there. Um, and so I've been going in there ever since, and um, I'm now one of the, I'm the actual program director now of Prison Restorative Justice. The monks have moved up to San Luis Obispo, Obispo and um, are working in the jails and prisons up there. And so I'm working with a woman named Sharon Crandall now, and we run the program. And so I'm going to very shortly become the senior chaplain at CRDF, which is the women's jail in Linwood, California. And so in the zip code play, they asked for pitches for a zip code. I just, I, I was like, I have to, I have to write this um, piece. And I wanted to write a piece about a mother and a daughter um, because in the women's jail, it's always that story. It's always a mother's incarcerated and her daughter's outside and doesn't understand, or the daughter is inside and the mother is outside and doesn't understand. And um, I think we don't think about, when we think about the incarcerated, we think about criminals. We don't think um, about the life circumstances that may have led to some of that criminal activity. We also don't think about how it tears families apart. And that um, what it means to a child to lose their parent to incarceration and how difficult it is to visit, to see, to contact 
to reach out to an individual who is incarcerated. It is unbelievably difficult to remain in contact with them. Um, and everything's observed too, everything's watched. So there's no private contact. Um, so if you just think about that, like think about what it's like to, um, you have something going wrong in your day and you can't have a private conversation with your mother or your sister or your daughter, it's always watched. And we know that that's like a little bit, you know, our surveillance state we have right these days where everything's being listened to and watched, but we don't really think of it. But um, I, I felt I had to write about this because people don't know what's going on in there. Um, and while I can't speak to everything that goes on in there, I can tell a story. I can take the experiences I've had through the women I've met and I can um, highlight and maybe illuminate some of what goes on in there and who those people really are. They're people, actually. They're not the other. They're actually just people like us. And um, and so I, I felt it was important to illuminate what was going on in there and illuminate um, the courage I see, um, the humor I experience, and the sorrow. And I, uh, so that for me was really important. And I was just so grateful that, um, that um, it was selected and chosen um, um, to be a part of it. I was really excited. It's a, a mother who is incarcerated and um, she's normally um, visited by her mother. Um, every week or so the mother comes as a regular visit. And then this time um, it's actually her daughter that shows up instead. And so it is a mother daughter reunion and they have not spoken for quite some time. And there are some very hard feelings and some misunderstandings. And it is a story that is about two women who should be connected or should be family who don't feel like family, but discover they are family. Um, and it also, um, part of the zip code plays mission is to highlight the zip code is to highlight this location in LA that maybe people don't know about. So it also talks a little bit about the history of Linwood itself, the city where this jail is sitting. And a lot of people don't know about um, because the characters lived in Linwood as well. And so it's a mother daughter reunion, I guess is the best way to say it. It also um, does highlight some of what goes on in the jail, some of the rules and what people have to deal with there. Um, and some of our misconceptions about what goes on in there, but it's all told through the eyes of um, uh, the mother and daughter, but the play is also set from the perspective of the mother. So a lot of people don't think about this, but um, in a radio play, you actually have to think about the camera. Where is the point of view? So in the play itself, you will hear that Mercy, the mother, she's clear. Her voice is clear. Her daughter's voice is through the visiting window and through the phone. So her daughter's voice is always different. It's not fully clear because we are in fully in the mother's point of view. So we are incarcerated in this episode. So it's a very subtle thing that not a lot of people picked up on, um, but it matters. Uh, again, a shout out to our amazing sound person, Jeff Gardner, who um, produces this whole thing and does all this stuff. He is adamant he talks to all the playwrights and directors and actors he says this we have to know what the point of view is we have to know where is the camera where are we looking to it matters with sound where the voice is coming from where we hear it um and because i directed one of the first zip code plays i got the lecture <laughs> i got the lecture about point of view in a radio play which i had never thought about as a writer and so i had a little pre-training so when i sat down to write the play i knew to make sure I had a very clear point of view, who was our lead character, you know? Um, and so I wanted to put it on the side of mercy, um, named that for on purpose, um, but I wanted to put it in very clearly in her point of view so that we would have that feeling of what it feels like to reach out to our loved one and their voice is always a little different and never quite clear. And the sounds, those really oppressive sounds that are in the jail um, that people also don't think a lot about um you know it sounds different and uh and a radio play is an absolutely 
perfect way to highlight how foreign the environment is for someone who's on the outside. Jeff Gardner, our, um, who produces and does everything, all the sound, he, um, he's been a Foley artist and he's worked with LA Theater Works, so he knows how to do live sound like in the moment, make things sound like what they sound like. Um, and he's done, you know, he's also done, I can't tell how many sound designs for, um, for theater around town here in Los Angeles and elsewhere. Um, but he really creates a world and he invites the playwright to think about the world itself as well. So he doesn't, he does this beautiful thing where he is not something that's added on, even though, yes, we record it. And then he puts the sound in afterwards. He invites the writer he's letting the writer create the world and then in enhancing it so not so much he's like frosting on the cake he's part of the cake he very much is there to serve the piece and create the sounds and the quality of the environment to illuminate the play so he is i think um yes he is another his work is another character in the play absolutely 100 percent. and um he's just a master he just knows how to do it, a sense of rhythm and timing, uh, what works, what doesn't work. Um, he's so helpful. He can tell you right away that that's something we can't do, or this is, yes, we can do that, or I'm not sure if we can do that. Let's try. Um, he's an artist in the highest sense of the world word. Um, and then the director, um, uh, D Jonathan Munoz Pru, I have worked with him before. He directed a play of mine, a reading of a play of mine uh, at Courage Theater. And um, I was introduced to him through that theater company and we just got each other. We just got along. He gets my writing. I have a very, um, my plays appear to be just how people talk, but they actually have a very specific rhythm to them. And he gets that. And he is, he's just an extraordinary director. He is loving and firm and clever and brilliant. And he works so well with actors. He's just, he's, He's got that perfect balance, what I call the mothering instinct, that perfect balance where he can love people, but also let's do it better, you know, and he's just so wonderful. And it's a very short rehearsal time we have, and he knows how to work in that frame as well. Um, he's just, you know, he is also a brilliant artist and also um, just a total pro. Um, so when they selected this piece, um, I was asked which director I'd like, and he was the first name on my list. I wanted to work with him and he was available and said yes. Um, so that was just a joy. Um, the actors, Juana Martinez and Claudia Elmore. Claudia um, was in the reading that Jonathan directed of that play. So, and that's how I got introduced to her as well. Um, she also then, um, when I was casting for Antias, I brought her in um, and she was in our production of Caucasian Chalk Circle. She is, she's just a dream. She is just, such a beautiful artist and um, funny and powerful and her voice is so beautiful and I just absolutely adore her. So that was um, what they say, a no brainer. Um, and then Quana, um, I've known Quana um, through Antias for years. Um, we actually um, were double cast in the same role in um, Hedda Gabler, produced back in the old space um, uh, at Antias in North Hollywood. Um, so we got to know each other you know, when you double cat, when you're double cast with another actor on a role at NTS, which is how we used to do all our productions, you get to know each other really well because you have to go through creating this character together and it can be hard. Um, so you, you really get to know each other. And I just, um, Kwana is, um, just such a powerhouse. She is, uh, but she's got this really soft, mushy heart and that it was just perfect casting for mercy. She's gotta be tough and strong and but she also just has this little mushy soft heart that is just so beautiful um and you know she's just an again another pro i just i knew the plays we don't have a lot of rehearsal time and we just need people who can bring it and can bring it quickly and powerfully and beautifully and professionally but who have that heart that is going to make it so um that can bring that vulnerability. And I know people who can work really, really fast. And I know people who can bring the heart. It's sometimes you don't always find those two to go together. And we just found it. We, it was lightning in a bottle. 
Um, and when I got back the first, um, we, I'm, I was there for the first read through and it was beautiful. But then when I got the first rough audio recording, I was just, uh, I was so excited. It was just beautiful. And then, um, everybody just came together so beautifully. I could not be happier with it. It's absolutely what I heard in my mind's eye that it would be. So the process was just, I was so blessed to have such incredible people. You know, for me, the difference between the radio play, the podcast versus an actual stage play, I mean, again, you can't see it. So you have to imagine it. Um, but I actually would, it has a slightly similar quality to writing a screenplay. Because when you write a screenplay, and I'm, I'm talking about the stage directions, right? The action lines. You have to write something that when people read it, so I'm not talking about what you'll see on the film. I am talking about when someone reads your screenplay, they have to read it and see it. So for me, I thought a little bit about when I write for film, television, new media, like, but they're talking it. It's not just, obviously you can't see the stage directions, but I thought about, I have to get people to see what they're saying and so it, it, it that's kind of how i thought of it um the difference is obviously you can't you're not communicating the story visually in what we see you're communicating the story visually through what you hear so i really thought about how much words and then the lack of words convey so again you can't just talk about stuff like for me you know oh look at that pencil you're holding you can't do that right you can't you don't want to do that that's talking down to your audience but if you know your character says i'm gonna write that down and then you just hear this little scribbling of the pencil we'll know what it is so there's a trust of your audience you have to have and um I love words. I love, I will sit and listen to characters talk forever. And I also, when I, even when I write my plays, they're really more auditory than they are visual anyway. Um, I'm not, I don't uh, think in a visual way, like a Julie Taymor way. That's not, I don't think that way. I think in how words carry meaning and, um, and not even words describing what we're seeing, just the way people talk, the way they run on their sentences and talk over each other and they're really, really fast and then they'll slow down because something happened or they stop talking and there's a silence. So for me, it was taking, really paying attention to rhythm, silence, and the tone of voice. So how people are talking, not just what they're talking about. And, um, and again, I think my skills as an actor, putting myself in the actual situation, like I act out all my plays when I'm writing them, I'll sit there and actually act them out. So I'll pick up the phone and talk. Um, and as Jeff Gardner told us, you have to, it, people are in space. We're just recording their voice. They're in space. And I think we don't realize how much we're conveying by the, our tone of voice and what we say and what we do. I mean, if you really close your eyes and listen, you pick up more, a lot more than you realize you do. You know, we're so dependent on our eyes, but we don't realize how much we're actually hearing. I think the Zoom world has actually highlighted that because the Zoom, even though we can see each other, the video quality is kind of flat. And sometimes you can't see people, but they'll go off video, but you can hear them. So um, I've taught a lot of acting over Zoom and people get very frustrated because they sometimes can't see each other. If they're looking at their script, they can't look at the other person. And then I say, well, why don't you listen? Why don't you listen to their voice? What do you hear? I encourage a lot of my acting students to do their rehearsals over the phone or to turn off their video and just listen. So for me, the difference was very subtle and it really wasn't that extreme. I felt it was sort of right in my wheelhouse um, because it's maybe again, because of my auditory nature, but it's how I like to write as a playwright. I like words to convey. I also, I guess it's a little bias I have for theater versus film, 
we can't compete with film in the theater. You know, we just can't. We can't set it in Arabia. We can pretend, which is its power. But so my feeling is why try? Let's watch what the human body is doing in space, how they're transforming the world around them, but their voice. And the, by the voice, I mean the whole body. But words, just words. I'm, I have a bias for it, I guess. So I think there, there's something in the theater about the human voice, the way we express our words and they become poetry. I think of it like we, you know, like I, one of my favorite musicals is Hamilton and I've never seen it. I've only listened to it, but I, I know there's amazing choreography. I do know that. And I know visually it's beautiful, but the auditory experience, I was fully immersed and I was fully there. So for me, um, using our words in rhythm and poetry and, um, telling a story just with words, I'm, I'm down. So I didn't feel it was that much different for me. I felt it kind of really settled in. There was a couple things I was like, Ooh, gosh, I have to think about how I'm going to do that. But again, because I knew the environment I was writing in, in a jail, I know what that's like. I know the sounds. And you have to be very alert when you're in the jail. You can't just be hanging out. You have to be very attentive and your eyes only go one direction. So you have to listen. It's really important. So I knew that environment and I knew Jeff Gardner would be able to make it sound good. So um, that carried a lot of weight itself. Well, I hope when the audience listens to the play, I hope um, they maybe think a little differently about the incarcerated, about what that experience is like. Um, I hope they recognize themselves um, in their own relationships with their family. I hope um, it tenderizes their hearts a little bit. Um, I think those you know, two things. If we can recognize ourselves in the other, we have a chance to not other the other. And so for me, um, the play is not there to say, you should go into the jails, you should vote a certain way, you should do something that I think you should do. That's not my job. My job is to hopefully allow the audience to recognize themselves in these characters or this situation and that that will open their heart, which will then open their mind and their eyes or their ears to see and hear in a different way. That for me is the only way anything's gonna change because that inspires a human to start to make good decisions as opposed to this is what you should do. I really am not in the game here to tell anyone what to do. I don't think that's healthy. Then it's you acting out something you think I should, you should do because I told you to. And I don't think that makes for good human beings. I think what makes for good human beings is a freedom to choose wisely. And um, I think we only are at liberty to do that when we see ourselves in the other because if we don't see ourselves in the other, then we're always under threat. And when we're under threat, we make very poor choices. We make closed minded choices. We make fearful choices. But if we can open our circle a little bit, then maybe we can make some braver choices. We can maybe be willing to step out of our comfort zone. Maybe we could consider helping somebody that we didn't think about helping before or listening to somebody we haven't listened to before you know i think a lot of us oh i'll donate here and i'll donate there and that's important but i encourage everyone to go to the places you're donating to and to actually have a physical response and feel what it's like to be in a circumstance where you there that you've not been in before i that's what i hope um and that for me um, is the only way I've seen people change is when they feel, um, you know, the old Coleridge quote, what comes from the heart goes to the heart. And that's what I hope. I love listening to Zip Code plays. Um, first of all, just 
because I can listen while I'm stuck in traffic, right? Like I can actually just, I can listen anywhere, which is so beautiful. But I also, um, I love you're just totally immersed. So the auditory experience is completely surrounding. Visual experience is only in front of us. You know, everything behind me right now, I mean, I can see it on my Zoom screen, but everything behind me right now is gone. It doesn't exist. Not until I do this. But auditory is three-dimensional. It's 360 degrees. It's immersive. And sound is very important to me, as I said. My vision is terrible. So for me, what I hear is so important. Um, and I also... I love that I'm not looking at something and I'm immersed in it. It's, it's, it's just so powerful to me. I also love listening to my fellow artists and what they come up with. I just like, I listen to some of these zip code plays. I'm like, I never would have thought of that. Like I would never write a play like that. That is amazing to me. Um, I also don't know a lot about these zip codes. I'm not from LA. And I think when a lot of people move to LA, they move to LA for the business. And so they get very um, uh, caught up in that. We get like a, on an agenda, on task. I'm here for my career. And we don't look at this incredible, beautiful city we have around us. Um, it's unbelievably diverse and exciting. And there's all these little pockets and corners. And because it's so spread out, we just don't go there. We tend to stay in our little safe neighborhood, our little clique. Or if we do go somewhere, we're going for an audition. And then we come back. And we don't have time to explore and so this project is offering people a chance to explore their own city that, you know, we get so busy, we just don't have time to. So I just, I love them. They are so funny and weird and unique and every single one is different. Even some we've had repeat writers, they're totally different. I just, it's incredible. Um, I love it. They're just, they're so beautiful. I love the way they're orchestrated too over a season. I, I really do try to listen to them in order and hear how they progress and how they've been put together. Um, and I love listening to Ramon who does the narration in between, who's a very dear friend of mine. Um, he also worked with me with incarcerated youth for years. And, um, so he's a dear friend and I love listening to his contribution, um, and how they're really crafted all together you can listen to one but you can also listen to this whole evening of plays or afternoon as the day would go on um so i just i love it i absolutely love it and it's opened my eyes to things i did not know um about the city and about my fellow writers and all these other um some actors i've not heard of i've i was like who's that actor i didn't know them that's ridiculous i should know them um, and also putting together the different actors. Like we have some actors in the company I've known for years. So the one I directed, the Pacific Palisades, I know Adrian, Harry, Nikki, I've known them forever. Um, and then to then hear actors together who've not known each other. So Quana and Claudia in my play, they've maybe met a couple times at Antias because Claudia did a show there and Quana's always there. Um, but they didn't really know each other. So they had to build this mother daughter relationship like that. And so that's also very exciting to me, putting together new actors who've not been together before. So um, yeah, I just love them. I'm so proud that we've done them. And it was such a wonderful thing to lean into during COVID, especially early on when we were, I mean, things are uncertain now, but it was so uncertain and we just didn't know what was gonna happen. It was such a beautiful place to, lean into during those uncertain times and i'm just so proud of all of us for doing it i love them yeah i love them and people can listen all over the world i mean i have friends all over the world i can they can tune in and listen people should listen to the zip code plays because it is in the antias tradition we are calling forth a theatrical experience from the past and highlighting and illuminating how it can be done today that anything we do as humans any way we create art is never lost it is only transformed or adapted but we stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before and i think it's important we do not forget that there are so many artists that their only medium they had was radio and nobody thinks about them, but now they are. So I think 
these zip code plays do what Antius does best, which is call forth the past and say, and now, why now? Why do we need to hear this now? We need to hear it now because we need to take this old art form that we've kind of forgotten about and bring it into the present to highlight what is going on in our world today and in the way this project also highlights these zip codes in Los Angeles, the historical precedence of these neighborhoods, how they've changed, how they've been lost, or how they've remained exactly the same, unbeknownst to anyone. Um, our history is important. And it, lest we forget where we've come from, whose land we're really standing on, whose, um, you know, whose hard work we are benefiting from. And we forget that. We get very caught up in our present day and the future, but we must remember where we've come from. So I think people need to listen to the plays just because they need to know like how cool Los Angeles is, but also how amazing radio plays are. Like just what you can really discern. Um, and maybe get off your screen for a while. Like maybe stop looking at this black mirror here and maybe listen and sit in space with someone, maybe listen together. Like, what an idea, huh? <laughs> the reason we, more voices of the community need to be heard in the theater, and like, as you said, Hamilton should be the rule, not the exception, is because that's just the truth. The truth is the world is diverse. The truth is that there are all these people walking around that we don't listen to. And if theater, Theater is supposed to be speaking to the audience today. And the audience today looks a little different than we think it does. Um, and theater is supposed to tell the truth. Now through metaphor and illusion and all of that, but it's supposed to tell the truth. That's the power of it. The reason we do classics is because they spoke the truth all those years ago. And guess what? They still speak the truth because we're humans. We're human beings. So we need to hear from different people because otherwise, then what are we saying? I'm not interested in hearing what people who have no relationship with people in everyday life. I, I have no interest in that. I don't need to know what's going on in the ivory tower um, because the ivory tower tells me what to do every day through my phone, through, you know, whether we like it or not, we are run by the people who hold the, her strings, um, if you will. And um, where else can we actually meet real people who deal with everyday struggles? Um, so I'm interested in the truth. And if you are not engaging with people in your community who look different, sound different, from different backgrounds, maybe they even speak a different language, then you're not engaging in the truth. And if we and the problem is when you don't engage in with people who are different than you, you become very fragile and very um, frightened and weak. We become very weak. And that's why we have to put up so many barriers because we're fragile. Um, and, and it's okay. That's what happens. And that's what has happened. And, you know, you're born where you're born and you're born with, you know, the programming you get from the culture you're born into. Um, but we need to start engaging. We need to start reaching out and understanding why people think differently, even if it's repugnant. We need to reach out to that. Um, you know, when I go into the jails as a chaplain, if you walk in with an agenda, oh boy, don't think about that. My job as a chaplain is to be a mirror. That means that mirror has got to stay clean. <laughs> I have to work on myself and my biases and my privilege and my judgments and my fear to fully be present for another human being. Um, that's why I think it's so important that we go to these marginal places, go in presence, not just on Zoom or not just, you know, on Twitter. We need to go there, our physical body, because something happens when you see and hear another story. So for me, go outside. I know it's hard right now with COVID, but go outside and look at the people in your neighborhood who is ringing up your groceries, who's picking you up in that Uber, who's your neighbor. A lot of people in Los Angeles don't know their neighbors. I don't know all my neighbors, I'm embarrassed to say. I'm getting a little better, 
but you know, every Monday when we have to move our cars for street cleaning, I start to see my neighbors. It's like, oh, hello, right. That's right, you live right there. So I think um, our theater needs to be the same. Our theater needs to be, it's a communal event. Theater is a communal event. Um, and we've gotten into this mindset that it's somehow this up on a pedestal thing. And it's not, it's not. It's a group of people getting together to tell a story about what's going on in the world. That's the point. So for me, if you're not, and also this is the other thing, an actor on the stage can be anything. Because if I can look at this chair and tell you it's a throne, that means I can be a king. I don't have to be a dude. I can be a king. Um, I directed a production of Julius Caesar uh, right before COVID hit um, with a group called Warriors for Peace, which is a veterans organization that does theater with veterans and civilians together. And um, we produced the play and it was completely diverse, like every walk of life. And we had women playing men, men playing women, older people playing younger people, younger people playing older people, because it was a group of actors putting on the play of Julius Caesar. And we had dancers creating ambiance and music and live sound. It's a play. It's a theater piece. This is not ancient Rome. This is Hollywood and we're at the Hudson Theater and we are a group of veterans and civilians getting together to tell this story about war and politics. So I'm a big fan of that. I, um, I think you need to look to your audience to uh, see who's coming to your theater, who's not allowed to come to your theater because of the price. And then that's your audience. Who are you doing it for? I think that's a really important question. And I think it needs to be asked over and over and over again. It's not a question you can answer once. You have to ask, ask it over and over again. Um, so I'm very passionate about um, our theaters coming off their pedestals a little bit and thinking about how could I do this piece right out on the street? Could we do it there? If we can't, we maybe should rethink things. I mean, I love fancy lights and I love fancy costumes. I love it. But what's it for? I think people right now don't need more sparkly stuff. I think we need deeper humanity now or we're not going to survive. And so I feel very strongly about um, we need to ask ourselves, what is the theater for over and over and over again? Playwrights Lab is important to um, Antaeus because it keeps the dust off the books. We are a classical theater company and we can get really caught up in old timey stuff. Um, we can get caught up in, oh, how is Shakespeare done right? We can, we're a group of people. We know each other really well. We're like a little closed circuit and we can just loop around again and again and da da da. The Playwrights Lab forces the fresh air. It forces us to keep the dust off the books, to look at something maybe we've never looked at before and to try something that may fail it may not work. We may try something. It's like, oh, that's a bad idea. But we tried it. We tried it and opened it up. It forces us to stay in the present and to look back at the classics as tales of humanity, not this little bubble that's our protected little shell. So, because we can all get like that. Like we like we we like what we know. You know, I like what I know. It's comfortable here. I like it this way. Ah, it forces us to change. And I think that's very healthy for us. Um, and again, it reminds us why we're here as artists. We're not here to tell stories of the past in a past way. We're here to tell stories of the past in the present. So it forces us to do that. So I love that. Um, and it's important to the theater community at large because it also gives other theaters a model of what they can do, you know? So other theaters, maybe they do a very specific kind of work. They can go, oh wait, we could do this too. Um, and I think it also, you know, there are a lot of theater companies in LA just dedicated to new work. So we're not cracking the mold there, you know, that we're following them and if anything, but I think then inviting maybe a theater company that does only new work to think of, wait, how could we do also expand into doing adaptations of classics? Like, so I think it's this beautiful um, offering of always looking again, what, what have our ancestors done? What have we done in the past? How can we bring that into the future? 
so that we're not getting theater companies that just do one thing. We're not like all in their own little niche. We're opening up this idea that what is a theater company? What could it be? Does it have to be just classical? Why can't it do new work? It's got great artists. Why not? Why can't a theater company dedicated to new writers also do an adaptation of a classic? Why can't they do that too? So I think it's offering um, a good stretching for the theater community, for Antius itself, keeping us fit. And it's offering the theater company, the theater community at large to invite in the question, wait, what could we do as a theater company? Um, and it's also just, it's bringing in new artists all the time. So that's, it's, you know, it's the idea that if water just flows into one place and there's no outlet, it becomes the Dead Sea. Water has to flow in and it's got to flow out. You got to keep that circuit going. And I open up the circuit, if you will. And so the Playwrights Lab forces us to do it, even when we don't want to. <laughs> so yeah, new voices new voices and i will say old voices that we maybe have not been listening to why should other artists get involved in antius theater company in the playwrights lab just why not <laughs> um because it's a great place because there's really clever wonderful artists there um and um and again I, we playwrights tend not to prom we don't know how to promote ourselves always because we're we spend a lot of time alone in front of a computer or a typewriter if anyone still does that or with a pencil and pen at a coffee shop and sometimes it's hard for writers to engage we can be private by nature and sometimes that's really hard but um to have a place where you can just kind of log in on zoom or show up at the theater, you can sit in the back and just heard your words read. So it supports different kinds of artists, not just us outward facing ones, but also maybe more private artists that are a little shyer, um, more shy, I guess. I don't know which one's right. I'll have to look that up. Um, it invites in different kinds of styles of artists. So um, you don't have to be this kind of writer. You can be this kind of writer. We have a writer in our group that basically created a play that's an, just a poem. It's a poem. It's actually a poem. It's a theatrical poem. And that's what it is. So uh, just, you know, it's, it's really a wonderful, I think it strikes that beautiful balance between it's exclusive and inclusive at the same time. That's a very, very tricky line to walk. And I think it has to be walked. If we're too exclusive, then we're not speaking to the community. If we're so inclusive, then it's a mess, right? We've got to find that way to have a structure that is open. And that requires constant attention and nurturing and allowing and stretching into places we don't want to stretch. And so I say to artists who to get involved with the Players Lab and with Antias, you're going to get stretched. So if you want a stretching, come. <laughs> theaters like Antius are, well, all theaters are so important because we need a place as humans to tell our stories and to tell them in a form because otherwise it just becomes a bunch of Facebook posts. So what we're getting in our world today through social media is a lot of, uh, posting so i'm expressing myself the problem is my expressions are not being received in a way that i can actually experience so i get little likes or thumbs up or someone screams at me back because they don't like what i said and then it becomes an argument so we're broadcasting but no one's really listening in the theater it's not merely expression it's conveyance so as an artist, I'm not, as a human being, I don't feel connected until I am experiencing conveyance. Expression is one thing, I'm, that is important. But when it's received by another human being and I see it being received, whether they like it or not, if they're like, ew, oh, wow, wow, why, why, ooh, why didn't you like it? That's when we feel human. And that's what a theater does. A theater is a place of conveyance of human expression. And if we are not experiencing conveyance, I think we die. I literally think we die. 
I think we starve and we die and we turn into what we are experiencing in our world where we're yelling and no one's listening. And so because no one's listening, we yell louder. But when you are in a theater experience, a storytelling experience, someone's listening, someone's talking. And then after it's over, it switches. And the audience talks to the artist. I loved how you did that. I loved how you did that. And the artist is like, oh, interesting or interesting. It's an exchange. And we're not exchanging right now. We're just screaming into the void. And what a shock. We don't feel heard because we're not being heard. And a theater experience, again, forces exchange. We have to sit and listen to each other. And then you listen, and then I listen, and then you listen, and then I listen. And um, I think people are hungry for that, and I think they're starving for that. So every local theater needs to be supported by the community because it's a place to go to practice that, to stay human, to stay present, to stay in the here and now. And theaters that have community, uh, communities that have theaters do better they do better people are kinder there's less crime there's more thriving there's more sharing there's more understanding wonder why so i encourage anyone you have an extra 50 cents throw it at uh, your local theater go find your local theater it's there you don't realize it's there it's above the pet shop you know, you don't know. What are all those people with white pieces of paper outside talking to themselves? Oh, it's a little theater. It's a little studio. Go there. See what's there. You know, it's so vital. It's so important. It's so important. We're starving and we need to feed ourselves. And that's how we feed ourselves. I'm Ann Noble and I'm a very proud member of Antius Theater Company and its Playwrights Lab. And I encourage everyone to come and listen, antius.org. Listen to all the zip code plays. You will learn a lot about Los Angeles. And I would also encourage you to pay a little more attention to the incarcerated, to the houseless, the people that are looking um, for homes out on the streets and the people you may not have such a fine opinion of. I encourage everyone to practice deep listening and um, you can find me also at prismjustice.org. That's Prism Restorative Justice. Um, we visit the incarcerated. And uh, I would invite you to come check that out. You might be surprised.